Hey guys, Richard with Fish and Nautil Channel, and we are here in the secret layer, top secret layer of Ore. And I'm here with my friend Adam, and he's gonna show us what's going on in the back behind the scene of Ore. Adam, how are you, man? Doing well. Good. good. Now tell me, what's going on here? This is one of three main hatchery buildings at uh, our facility here. Right. Um, and behind us is one of three broodstock rooms. Okay. In this room, we have pairs of gobies, dottybacks, clownfish, blennies, cardinalfish, a wide assortment of the, the species that we raise here. There's usually two people uh, per day maintaining this room. Mm -hmm. This room contains about 500 pairs or groups of breeding fish. Okay. Um, across the three rooms, um, we have uh, close to 2,000 uh, broodstock pairs and groups um, wow. of, of fishes. Gotcha. Um, and so, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of work to take care of that much broodstock. For sure. With that amount of broodstock, we're able to maintain yeah. a very good degree of genetic diversity. Right. Um, despite the variety of fish that we raise. Yeah. We're constantly, uh, well, at, at this time, we're raising uh, about 54 to 58 different species of yeah. fish. You know, um, when I post a lot of stuff about aquaculture and stuff like that, a lot of people ask me, what are some of the terms here, like, you know, like F1, F2? You see a lot of people throw those kind of terms around. Can you explain something about that? That's basically the filial generation. Basically tells you how many generations removed from a wild fish. Um, it's a designation for that fish yeah. uh, removed from wild yeah. uh, counterpart. So. Gotcha. And you know, you guys are like revolutionary when it comes to aquaculture. You guys kind of like started this whole craze of aquaculture before it became cool. Um, what what made you guys to like you know start on the aquaculture when is everything was so much cheaper to do a wild caught at the time? The foundation of ORA was laid when Aqualife Research uh, Corporation in Walker's uh, K Bahamas, mm -hmm. uh, and that shut down abruptly. Uh, they moved the tanks, the, the equipment, the broodstock here to Harbor Branch. Gotcha. That's what started ORA. And you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, before this whole craze of clownfish, you know, it's, the clownfish is such an iconic fish. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the hobby, people that are not in the hobby, recognize a clownfish when they see it. Right. Oh, Nemo, you know, like yep. everybody recognizes it. What made you guys start on that um, fish in, in particular? Well, this is, I get asked this question a lot. Mm -hmm. and. You know, some, as somebody who's kept fish most of their life, sometimes you forget about these fish. You forget about the regular fish you see every day. Right. The thing about clownfish is mm -hmm. they are really the most well-suited marine ornamental fish for, uh, for, for keeping in aquariums. Very true. In the wild, I mean, they live in a space about this big, right? right. In their anemone. You know? Right. They're, you put them in an aquarium, they're not stressed out by the fact that they're in a confined space. They actually right. like that. Yeah. So um, these fish just, from the first time people started keeping them in aquariums, mm -hmm. they've done well. Yeah. Um, and they have interesting behavior. Their swimming motion is yeah. uh, recognizable and unique. Um, yeah. uh, they have personalities. Right. Um, hardy, like I said. They're just a really all-around great Right. Aquarium fish, whether you're a beginning aquarist or a seasoned aquarist. Uh, right. Pretty much everybody that has a reef tank should have a pair of clowns in there. I agree. The I, I agree. Things, so. Yeah. It also helps that they're extremely hardy, like you said, because they're part of the damsel family. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, like you said, it, it suits for basically for everybody. And then, um, how did this whole, like, a designer clown craze come about? Like, where did they, like, do they, um, how did they first occur? Like, from the wild, I believe, right? Well, yes. Some of them were from wild specimens, like yeah. I said, that we obtained. Mm -hmm. And others were from other captive producers and or that we produced here. Yeah. Uh, uh, an example that I will be able to show you here shortly in this building, we have the original Picasso that was collected um, wow. from the Solomon Islands. Yeah. And uh, that fish is still spawning today. Nice. Um, and 
that fish, I would say, is responsible for designer clownfish craze. So, so it's kind of the thing that was going on in the freshwater, yeah. tropical right. side of things for what it, it seems like eons before, yeah. um, with all the live bears and angelfish and koi. Yeah. Uh, they realized, oh, this has a place in the marine yeah. industry as well. So, right. um, you know, I would say probably the Picasso, mm -hmm. um, and we had some of the first uh, snowflakes uh, that were captive. Snowflakes were from captive produced fish. Okay. And we obtained them um, more in England, I believe, uh, okay. uh, early 2000s. And we have those fish here, mm -hmm. and that started a whole new strain on the Amphibrion Ocellaria side of things with wow. uh, genetic uh, potential for creating designers. So um, it's a combination, wild fish, fish mutations that have pop up in captivity, mm -hmm. and then our ability to just select for them here and, and cross and, and, and see what we can produce with the different genetic variation we have in our fruit stock rooms. Gotcha. So I noticed that this is the, the greenhouse uh, system. How, tell me how, how this, how you guys have a set it over, over here. It looks like you guys have a larval state uh, section. You have a different sizes. Yes. And then what are, how the temperatures are ran, filtration and stuff. Okay. Well, our fish production mm -hmm. consists of four main departments. The first is the live feeds department. In that building, we uh, hatch artemia. Mm -hmm. We maintain rotifer cultures. Okay. We maintain copepod cultures. Uh, we also do some experimentation in that room with uh, raising different species of sea urchin. Um, and um, uh, we, we don't grow our own algae right now, but yeah. we plan to get to that um, soon, hopefully. And okay. um, from that step, we have the larval uh, step. The, all of our live feeds production is used in house. We don't grow copa pods to sell or, or anything right. like that. Um, pretty much all the copa pods we raise, we feed our larval fish. Yeah. So yeah, behind us, the brood sock room, one of three. Um, the eggs produced in here um, get transferred to our larval room. Right. They hatch there, uh, and the fish stay there for usually six to 12 weeks, depending on the species. Yeah. Um, they reach a certain size, and then we can count them and move them to our grow out. Uh, okay. Department. That is the last stage in the fish production process here at ORA. Yeah. Uh, the fish spend most of their time in there. Um, we have lots and lots of grow out space. Um, uh, that those systems are maintained um, with um, large filtration units, sand filters, degassers, UVs. Yeah. Um, we're, we're constantly um, siphoning the tanks. Um, yeah. It's 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 a lot of work to to get fish from a juvenile stage to a cellar size as fast as you can. Right, right, um, right. And um, that that's pretty much how the, how the fish hatcheries are laid out. Um, yeah. We have redundant rooms in, in the event that you know something happens of a, a power failure or, or whatnot. Um, all our brood stocks not in one space. Um, yeah. We have we have it spread out across the facility, um, gotcha. and that's worked out well for us. Um, and all of our hatcheries are maintained um, at about, we shoot for 80 degrees uh, air temperature. Okay. Uh, whatever the air temperature is, that's yeah. going to dictate what the water temperature is. Yeah. Um, in the wintertime, we run propane heaters to keep the buildings warm. Yeah. Uh, in the summertime, it gets warmer than 80 degrees in here. We have, right. You can probably hear them. The yeah, fan, the giant fans, fans in the, the back. The building. Yeah. They just, in the summertime, are constantly moving air through the buildings. Yeah. That helps to um, promote evaporative cooling and keep the systems at a slightly cooler temperature. But throughout the year, our system temperatures, um, our larval tank temperatures, grow up temp temperatures, root stock temperatures, range anywhere from 78 to 82 degrees. Um, gotcha. um, and the fish um, actually do quite well at those temperatures. Right. Even fish that you wouldn't expect to. Like, yeah. uh, there's, there's some species that we raise that come from Japan that uh, where in their natural habitat, they're dealing on average with waters in 60 degree Fahrenheit. Really? Uh, like the Kamahara blennies, the um, white spotted filefish. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, on paper you'd think they'd like much cooler water, right. but they have adapted very well to our warmer water here and, and do quite well for us, usually during the winter months when it's closer to the high 70s, but nice. um, we... we uh, it's funny that you talked about that Gobi. Um, I was actually at 2013 Magna in Miami when Koji from Japan brought some of those Gobi over the, the Kamahara Blini? I think so, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember because we got our brood stock from Koji. Yeah, because I remember because um, he came in from Japan. He actually acclimated that fish in Julian's sump. Uh -huh. And I remember I was like I was talking to him about it. That's very interesting. That's very uh, well. It's a very exciting time for aquaculture right now. I'm very very much looking forward to what you guys produce here and here. And like I said before, I'm a huge ras guy, so I can't wait to see what kind of ras you guys produce and take a sneak peek behind and see what kind of brood stock you have. So that something that I could look forward to in the future. Um, and hopefully sooner than later, uh, we will see rise of a. Uh, more species and as a leader in the aquaculture industry I look um, I'm, I'm keeping my definitely keeping my fingers crossed and looking forward to what you guys do thank you for having me here Adam yeah sure All right, Thank you.